There was a point where the show ended with the Montreal story, but you can't end there. Because otherwise the show is, Brexit is terrible, Trump's a nightmare, your heroes are sex pests, racism is unsolvable, bye. (laughs) And that is not a fun entertainment experience. I have found. That's why we preview. So sorry, Aldershot. <laughs> Twas a bleak night in Hampshire. <laughs> so I was trying to think, how do you optimistically end a show like this at a time like this? What is the way that you end a show with any optimism? And I looked back on a conversation that I had a couple of years ago with a friend of mine called Rennie Edo Lodge. Now, Rennie is a writer who wrote an incredible book called Why I'm No Longer Talking to White People About Race, which is why she, as a woman of colour, is no longer going to justify being angry about racism. It is a great book and I would urge you all to read it. Now, I got to interview Rennie and I asked her, what, where is the optimism right now? Because she's smarter than me. I'm hoping that she has some kind of wisdom. And she did have something great that I want to share with you. She said, the thing is, everyone is engaged right now. People are engaged. And this awakening cannot be quashed. This awakening cannot be quashed. That's a really nice way of phrasing it. And she's right. People are so much more engaged than they were 10, 15 years ago. When I was growing up, we didn't see any connection to politics or if it had any meaning in our real lives. You know, the only thing we did was protest the Iraq war, but even then that seemed sort of distant from us. Now, people are engaged. A million people marched on London for a people's vote, right? That's absolutely incredible. Also, more importantly, 16-year-olds are walking out of school to protest climate change. That is absolutely incredible. That is absolutely incredible. Because we've shat the bed so much with this Brexit bullshit that they're like, well, the adults seem completely insensible. It's great. And the thing is, it's important on all of us to act on this awakening. It's important that we continue to fight and stay engaged and stay motivated. It's not enough for us to just sit together in this safe space and have a laugh about it. We now need to get out there and get in people's faces. And look, I am aware that I have more responsibility than most people in this room because I have a platform. And let me tell you, it's a platform that I now feel obliged to use in ways I never would have felt comfortable before Brexit. Also, Brexit blew up the part of my brain that's supposed to stop you from telling people to go fuck themselves. <laughs> So, in the last two and a half years, I have, in strict contravention of my Hindu upbringing, been having serious beef. (laughs) I got asked to introduce Sajid Javid. Now, if you don't know who Sajid Javid is, he's the Home Secretary, and he's a prominent Asian conservative. (laughs) I have to do the last show of this here on Monday and my friend is coming whose new girlfriend is an Asian conservative. And I said to our other friend who is also Asian, should I take that bit out? And she said, no, if anything, do it louder because they have to learn. (laughs) Anyway, Sajid Javid and my politics are, shall we say, divergent, right? (laughs) So before Brexit, if I'd been asked to introduce him, I would have said, absolutely not. Two months after Brexit, they asked me to introduce him, and I said, Oh, I'll introduce him. I'll introduce the fucking shit out of him. And they were like, Will you, Nish? Because you haven't blinked in a while. Also, you keep using the phrase, introduce the fucking shit out of. We are a tad concerned. And they were right to be concerned. I walked out on stage and said, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the stage with absolutely no applause because he deserves none, a representative of a government who's fundamentally ruined this country. And then I fucked off right now. No, 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 no. Don't clap that. Don't clap that. Because where were you on the night when I needed you? I could have used some of that applause on the night. Fuck me, that thing went down like a sack of shit. Where were any of you on the night of the Asian Small Businessman of the Year Awards? Where were you? I could have used you. And the thing is, I don't know if what I'm doing is correct. I worry that I'm making things worse by my very presence in this kind of elevated discourse, right? What you want in those situations is a smart, qualified person of colour, not a professional asshole. But... I'm being asked these things and I'm saying yes to them. I went on Robert Peston's program. That's no place for a comedian. The other two people on there were Nadine Dorries and Kate Hoey, two pro-Brexit ministers from the Conservative and Labour parties respectively. And fun fact, a pair of cacophonous bell ends. Oh my God! What a pair of thunderously stupid fucking dickheads. 
At one point, Kate Hoey goes off on one defending Donald Trump. She's a Labour MP and she's there saying, Donald Trump, the thing about him is that he stands up for Americans. And I'm looking at Robert Peston going, Peston, you Harry Potter face motherfucker, get in the game. She's talking horse shit. And the thing is, I really like Robert Peston, but I think he's like a lot of people currently in the media. He's struggling to cope with what's happening right now because he really wants, and I think this is totally laudable, us to have like an Aaron Sorkin West Wing episode, exchange of ideas, where you've got two equally valid but divergent perspectives that are broadly the same. But we are not dealing with that anymore. Some people are talking fucking shit and need to be told that they're talking fucking shit. So, it, but listen, they, it needs to come from someone with some authority, not me. He he needed to say that. We needed to hear that. You know, because I ended up turning to her and going, I think you mean white Americans, Kate. And fun fact, she did not want to split a cab home, even though we'd been previously established we were going in the same direction, right? <laughs> But that is not where the accountability should come from. It needs to come from the professional award-winning journalist, not a 33-year-old stand-up comedian whose favourite food is dips. That is not good. <laughs> also, I fucking love dips. I don't apologise for loving dips. Here's how much I love dips. I eat hummus straight out of the tub with a spoon. I don't cut it with bread like you fucking animals. I love hummus. I eat it like a chickpea soup. It's delicious. My favorite flavor? You like hummus? Favorite flavor? Red pepper, goodness me. I didn't realize I was in the presence of a connoisseur. My favorite flavor, thanks for asking. Jesus Christ, my favorite flavor. It's lemon and coriander. It gives me the shits, but I eat it anyway. <laughs> lemon and coriander goes through, it's like a log flume. It's like it goes in my mouth and all my organs disappear and it just goes straight down in. Sometimes I just eat it sat on the toilet because I'm like, what's the point? <laughs> 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 Sometimes I just take it and throw it past my dick and balls because I'm like, what's the point of this? <laughs> Is this the guy you want talking to politicians? <laughs> No! Something is fundamentally wrong with our discourse! Anyway, this is how I ended up on Question Time. <laughs> Not this! I didn't talk about throwing hummus past my dick and balls and they were like, there's our guy.